So yesterday the Binance Smart Chain was shut down for several hours. There was a hack with a particular bridge. And I just not necessarily want to focus on the fact that the Binance Smart Chain was down, but I just want to talk about the overall premise of decentralization. I want to talk about EOS. I want to talk about Ethereum. I want to talk about ThorChain and various other mechanisms. So getting into this like i said it was it was down for several hours and i was actually going to do some stuff with the binance smart chain and then it was like well i better wait and even after it had been back up and i could see on bsc scan that um blocks were being you know there were transactions happening there was activity happening um i just didn't feel comfortable with it and um just waited until today so that being said we have to kind of question like and obviously people have brought up this situation of centralization with the Binance Smart Chain as um, a particular issue. And I like the Binance Smart Chain overall, and I like the ecosystem, and I like um, I like BuySwap, I like Venus, I like some of the money markets like Venus. Um, you know, the exchanges, PancakeSwap and um, BuySwap, I feel like that those are some of the best decentralized exchanges in the entire crypto space. Um, but there is this obviously this centralization issue now it's it's kind of like you have to have multiple entries and multiple exits and within the Binance smart chain you can completely come up with an entire portfolio I mean you could have Cardano on there you can have Tron on there it's all tokenized on there Ethereum Bitcoin um, you know there's all kinds of stuff that's Dogecoin Litecoin you know polka dot all this stuff is tokenized on the Binance smart chain so you could really build out an entire portfolio and do everything in crypto on the Binance smart chain but then what if it shuts down like this what if it shuts down for five days ten days a month what if a government for some reason seizes control puts a gun to CZ's head and um, decides to shut everything down so we have to worry about that so I think that it is very important to keep some of your assets on their native chains whether that's bitcoin litecoin dogecoin and then it's actually on its native chain it's not an exchange it's not tokenized on the binance smart chain it's not tokenized on polygon it's not tokenized on um, phantom solana avalanche so on and so forth so these digital decentralized exchanges to me are very very important to the ecosystem um, but it's like each ecosystem needs to have honestly multiple nodes controlled by separate entities and um, there needs to be multiple entries and exits through bridges to other decentralized exchanges that don't require KYC uh, simply for the fact that that's an attack vector you know you're gonna there's some small exchange and stuff you're putting all your information in there they're wanting your social security number they're wanting um, they want your passport and all that kind of stuff that's something a hacker can get go after now, um, the next evolution of some of this decentralized kind of swaps is really kind of the Thor chain. And, um, you know, the interesting thing with it, it is native, like you can trade native, not tokenized, not, not wrapped Bitcoin, not wrapped Ethereum, not wrapped Dogecoin, not, you know, any of that. Natively, you can trade from like Ethereum to Litecoin or Ethereum to Dogecoin or Dogecoin to Bitcoin, so on and so forth. Um, this is very, very valuable to the ecosystem. Now, last cycle, 2017, 2018, there was a lot of talk of the atomic swaps, uh, but a lot of those mechanisms never got fully developed. And I think even with something like atomic wallet is not necessarily what we consider kind of an atomic swap uh, that people were working on. It just never seemed to, it never seemed to scale. Uh, they never were able to really kind of do it on a large scale. So it's like these decentralized exchanges on these Ethereum virtual machine compatible uh, ecosystems have really kind of become one of the best solutions. Now, I like a lot of this bridging kind of back and forth and being able to get to this chain, that chain, and the other chain. It's very, very confusing to users, though, because they're like, wait a minute. Okay, I have Bitcoin over here, but it's this is a BEP20 wrapped tokenized version of bitcoin on the binance smart chain and then they're getting confused because then it's like well there's bep2 you know there's this bep2 chain this what they're calling a beacon chain for the binance 
for Binance, which is further confusion because if you remember with Ethereum, when they first propped up the beacon chain before they did the merge, that was called the beacon chain. So then it's like Binance renamed their BEP20, their old BNB, to this beacon chain thing. And then instead of saying Binance Smart Chain, they've sort of changed the name of that as well slightly. So all this becomes very, very confusing. People could screw themselves over very quickly because your address would be the same on Phantom, on Avalanche, on Ethereum. You end up using the same address and um, you're controlling con tokenized versions on these on these different ecosystems, on these different chains or with Phantom. It's not necessarily a blockchain, but um, that being said, all the attack vectors and um, for the bridge to go down or for there's some of these centralized nodes to go down, uh, it becomes very worrisome. And then when you have Ethereum, now this went to proof of stake, a lot of these exchanges are gonna control a lot of the supply because people, the easiest thing, because it is so confusing, is that they're gonna to go to an exchange and you know, like a crack and like a Coinbase, and they're gonna to try to earn the staking rewards that way instead of staking it themselves. Further creates a problem. Also, we saw the same thing happen with EOS. Uh, you know, you had the block producers and then we got a very centralized um, you know, situation. And, and back in 2018, I actually had one of the block one employees actually said to me that he felt like there was only really six block producers that the rest of them were sock puppets and um he just wasn't very bullish on the whole premise of the ease of, of of the eos mainnet at that time um and just a little bit of a, a background again if you're kind of new and you don't know the eos ecosystem and you haven't followed this channel for a while essentially you know block one created the EOS IO software and it was left to the quote unquote community to launch any of these chains, which ultimately became EOS, Telos, um, you know, there ended up being other stuff like Wax that you utilize the EOS IO software. So uh, that being said, with the EOS mainnet, it just kind of got completely controlled by these like large whales and these exchange accounts that were the block producers. And a lot of the people who are doing a lot of work that were in the community were actually kind of ended up being edged out um, and it alienated a large portion of the community. Now, that being said, there were the centralization issues. A lot of people called that out. Um, Ethereum being proof of work and anybody could, you know, pop up their GPU rigs, start mining Ethereum and try to overpower others on the network. Um, now they've went to the proof of stake. And so you could essentially have a very, very similar situation there. So my, I guess, all in all, I think it's very important to sit there and think, how can you enter and exit the crypto market if every centralized exchange shut down, essentially? Um, and that's a very, very tall order. Um, but let's just say all the main fiat gateways got shut down in the United States. For instance, Kraken, Coinbase, um, you know, let's say Uphold, um, you know, FTX, Gemini, let's say all they all got shut down somehow, which I feel like you should be spread across all those because at various times when when there's a lot of traffic on these blockchains and there's a lot of trading volume just in general, uh, these exchanges seem to go down at the worst possible moment, just about when you're going to like profit heavily, um, then it's like, oh, it's an overload, you know, and then suddenly Coinbase is back down again. We've all experienced that. So um, that being said, I think that you should have accounts open to all of these, FTX, Gemini, Uphold, Coinbase, so on and so forth. Um, pick and choose, but if you had, you know, you had three or four of these options to get in and out, that's, that's one kind of um, thing that's going to kind of diversify your ability to get in and out. Secondly, uh, the, the, the Bitcoin ATM network has increased in size over the years. Um, some of you might know I had the first Bitcoin ATM actually in Arizona and at the time there was about 176 Bitcoin ATMs worldwide. Now there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of them. Uh, the ecosystem's really grown and oftentimes it's not just Bitcoin. You can often trade, you know, get in and out of Litecoin and Dogecoin on those as well as potentially Dash and other, other um, you know, options, Ethereum as well. So 
you do have that uh, to get in and out. And then, you know, but if all the centralized exchanges go down, you have to kind of question some of these, um, some of the way that ATMs work is actually that it interacts with centralized exchanges to do buy and sells and uh, facilitate this third party transaction. It's not that they actually have the um, coins in a hot wallet on there. So various ATMs work differently. Um, so that's another thing. And then these other stuff like the Exodus wallet and the Atomic wallet, um, you know, on the back end, it's likely, you know, tapping into the centralized exchanges and stuff. Um, so then it's just like, I think that people need to have kind of some of these exchange accounts on stuff that doesn't require KYC, KuCoin, um, you know, Hotbit is another option, Probit, you know, these kind of ones. And then, um, you know, you have the ability to bridge in and out of these different ecosystems on and off of the native chains. See, when they shut down Binance.org, that was the Binance bridge that allowed you to kind of get on and off the Binance smart chain. But then they wanted to funnel everybody through Binance. Um, but another another way to get on and off of these exchanges, and I'm trying to remember what that exchange was. I just used it here um, recently, and it actually, it, it works on the Binance cloud, but you can get in there basically with a VPN. You don't necessarily need to do like KYC and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's, it's escaping me right now. I kind of did a review on it kind of previously that I used it, um, but they actually had the ability to I was having a problem with Zcash. I had Zcash and Binance Smart Chain tokenized Zcash, but I needed to get it back to the native chain. And without the Binance bridge, um, that was that was a lot harder to do. So if you have some of those, um, but I would say essentially, and even like the Hive ecosystem, the Hive ecosystem is interesting because you can wrap Hive and you can wrap uh, the high back dollar and you can get over to the Binance smart chain that's just like tokenized on the Binance smart chain to so get back to hive and then um, you know through various mechanisms with hive you could use some of these swippy swaps you know type things um, there's a few of these kind of swapping mechanisms that don't require KYC and you could get in and out of this you could get back to like the Bitcoin Ethereum some other you know maybe Dogecoin or something like that um, so you need the ability to get in and out of these exchanges, and I would not put all your assets on one of these ecosystems, whether it be the Binance Smart Chain, whether it be Phantom, whether it be Avalanche, um, and I wouldn't put all your assets on one chain. That's why I think that even if you are natively holding in a cold wallet just Bitcoin, somehow, some way, something could be figured out eventually, and I've, I've feared the quantum computer situation and actually back in 2018, I sort of assessed it and I was like, well, let's just be conservative and say it'd be like three or four years. Well, we're at that point. So how many more years is it gonna be until um, they can pretty readily and pretty effectively crack the encryption of stuff like Bitcoin and Litecoin with atomic computers? They might be able to already do it, um, like fairly consistently, I don't know. Um, and I don't think we're gonna know that for a bit, but that being said, with all the things happening in the world, it is very, very imperative that the crypto industry continues to move towards this decentralization. And we saw the first iterations of this with stuff like BitShares. We've seen it with the delegated proof of stake kind of chains, but we've also seen it with this new iteration of the DeFi ecosystems um, across all these various chains. So. I just think it's very, very important that you kind of keep that in mind to diversify code base wise. Again, Bitcoin and Litecoin or, and Dogecoin are essentially very similar code bases. Um, Monero is a different code base. Ethereum is a different code base. So you spread across a few of those, then you've kind of diversified code base wise. And then don't keep everything on centralized exchanges. Don't keep any everything on one centralized kind of ecosystem like the Binance Smart Chain. Um, and, you know, have this ability to move in and out and have already readily accounts that are maybe through the fiat gateways, but then also through these, um, you know, these other various exchanges that are trusted that you can move in and out of 
like KuCoin, for instance, that don't require KYC. So um, that's all that is very, very important for kind of the health of the ecosystem and maintaining this because uh, just with everything happening, guys, uh, both in Europe, the United States, and just across the world and everything, don't be completely surprised at what links they're going to go to to sort of tighten the news, tighten the news, tighten the news, tighten the news. Um, obviously, they're playing a whack-a-mole situation and there's there's a moving target and all that kind of stuff like that. Uh, but at the end of the day, that is one of the big benefits of Monero is it does have true fungibility. So I do think that Monero should be in people's portfolio. You don't want them blacklisting Bitcoins or Litecoins or Dogecoins because this or that previously happened, you know, two owners in the past or something like that. It'd almost be like these dollar bills, you know, if they found traces of cocaine on it, that if they blacklisted and said, no, we can't accept that. For the most part, dollar bills, the U.S. currency has a certain amount of fungibility. Bitcoin and Litecoin and Dogecoin um, does, but it doesn't. And it's really kind of, kind of your stuff like Monero is really kind of the show in town that it's very imperative that I feel like that you do keep a little bit of Monero in your portfolio and um, it does kind of meet all the criteria of true sound money. So that being said, guys, what do you think about that? Are you guys already on the Thor chain? And one kind of heads up, if you are wanting to try to um, play with the Thor chain ecosystem, you can do it through shapeshift.io. They, they have integrated with um, that ecosystem and kind of went away from their old mechanisms that they used to use. So have you guys used it? What do you guys think of the Thor chain? And what do you think of the centralization of Ethereum and some of these other chains like the Binance Smart Chain? Leave a comment below. Please like this video. And please subscribe to this channel. That is free. And please follow me on all social media at Brian Phobos, YouTube, Instagram, Steam it, Twitter, Hive, DTube, everywhere. See you guys. Mm-hmm.